Ball State Library of Explication Tapes. The following discussion of literature is one of a series made possible through a Lilly Endowment grant. The award was made by the Committee on Foundation Grants of the Association of College and Research Libraries, a division of the American Library Association. These grants are for the purpose of promoting more extensive and imaginative use of library resources by undergraduate students. Unless otherwise specified, the panelists are members of the English Department of Ball State Teachers College. Two poems of William Blake. Discussing these poems are Professor Theodore Cogswell, Professor Jean Andrews, and Professor David W. Shepard. London by William Blake. I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Now, gentlemen, if we can start on the first stanza of this poem, Professor Shepard, what do you think Blake means by the word chartered here as applied to a street? Well, this means that the street is mapped out. It is officially mapped out. Each section of it is officially assigned. The same thing pertains to the Thames. Each dock is officially Assigned. Everything has been done by man. Everything's mapped out. Everything is in its place. Uh, you have no freedom of access to the river. You have no freedom of access to anything on the street. This is the activity of man. Everything is regulated. Yes, I wonder if here Blake isn't, in a sense, punning on the word chartered. I think that the word suggests not only the word chart, uh, meaning map, but also it um, has the, perhaps its first denotation of hired, so that not only are the streets carefully laid out according to plan, but also, especially in connection with the Thames, the river has been hired, or it has been sold, so that not only do we get the idea then of uh, uh, carefully regulated, but I think also the idea of sold for hire. I think that would be a legitimate interpretation of the word. It's a word that seems to have vanished from our vocabulary, at least within my experience. I'm not sure what the technical or legal jargon is for it in our society. Well, of course, one still charters a bus. Uh, in order to go to a to basketball game, let's say, uh, one would charter a bus in the sense of hiring it. Uh, I think perhaps the most uh, common use, the one we're familiar with, is uh, we talk of city charters. Well, I think this pertains more to what we would call the plat. Everything is laid out and it's assigned, bought, uh, it certainly comes in here. Uh, but above all, it seems to me that everything here is regulated. Uh, we could use, interpret charter in several senses. But I think the important thing is that this is a man-made regulation. Yeah. Uh, the Magna Carta, the Great Charter, uh, that this is a city which is controlled by man, in which man's laws operate, uh, rather than natural law, which results in weakness and marks of woe. We might dismiss the word charter as unimportant, but I think that... Uh this particular interpretation becomes more and more important as we get on into the poem. 
Yes, I think that, that these uh, two ideas of carefully regulated by man and also sold for hire uh, strike a keynote theme in this poem. It's interesting also to see that at this early stage, Blake utilizes a device which we see uh, throughout the poem, that is the device of repetition, uh, chartered, twice used in the first two lines. And we'll notice that in the, uh, the next two lines of the same stanza, and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe, we see the word mark used uh, three different times. I might uh, note that the, what is it that marks in every face I meet? Well, the subject is the Chartered Street, the Chartered Thames, apparently the activity which regulates this is the same activity which uh, marks in every face uh, weakness and woe. Well, of course, I is the grammatical The grammatical, but uh, mark. The, uh, this uh, and mark, I wander through, of course, uh, I also notice rather than, than mark, but uh, one interpretation that came to my mind at the moment is, does he mean I notice in every face, or does he mean that the chartered Thames and chartered uh, street uh, have this effect? I've always assumed that, um, that the grammatical subject uh, and the logical subject are the same mm -hmm. here. That is, that mark here simply means notice, although, of course, again, the next two marks that are used uh, are used in a slightly different sense. I think it's um, interesting also to notice that with Blake, um, one has to watch very closely or he will be hypnotized by what, what one might call the nursery rhyme effect of Blake's diction. Uh, his language is quite childlike uh, at first glance. We discover that he uh, repeats words in the way that a child might repeat them. For instance, uh, uh, Brooks and Warren have commented that uh, the statement, mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe, uh, suggest uh, the child's expression such as, I am going to build a building with my blocks. Uh, and, unle and unless we watch uh, very closely, I think we're likely to do an injustice to Blake because often there is a, a much more profound meaning uh, than the diction would suggest. Well, I would think that it would be something in Blake's favor uh, to note that he exploits this rather simple vocabulary in this uh, well, sort of a hypnotic fashion. What about the second stanza? Uh, I think that I'll have to concede my original point it was in error that he notices in every face uh, marks of weakness, marks of woe. Uh, we get into the second stanza. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind forged manacles I hear. Uh, very elementary. Uh, again, the repetition of every through here. Yes, I think the every um, builds up with a sort of crescendo effect. Uh, every is repeated Oh, what, four or five times uh, in this very short stanza, and I think with each repetition, uh, the emphasis becomes uh, greater. Well, while you're speaking of repetition, I wonder, in this last line of the second stanza, the mind-forged manacles I hear, uh, Professor Cogswell, does this go back to the first stanza at all? Yes, I think uh, what he is doing here is defining the word that uh, we spent some time on, chartered. The, we start out with a statement of the chartered street and chartered Thames, uh, which isn't defined at this point, but immediately in connection with this we have first the faces we see, and then secondly the sounds we hear, uh, weakness and woe equaling the cries of fear, and then in the final line, I think we have an explanation as to why these things exist. The mind forged manacles, the rules, the regulations that man has created himself 
which keep him from leading what Blake would consider to be the free and <coughs> natural life. And the chartered city is simply uh, one reflection of this. At this point, we would not say that Blake is a predestinarian then, if he is, in fact, getting into uh, theological considerations. No, evil, evil is man-made, not devil-made, I think. Yes, I think here, clearly enough, man is, has forged his own chains. Uh, specifically, what sort of chains would you say that uh, Blake is referring to here? Now, I realize that he uh, doesn't identify any particular mind-forged manacles uh, in, this, uh, in this poem. From your uh, knowledge of, uh, of Blake's uh, principal themes in his other poetry, uh, Professor Cogswell, uh, do you have any ideas about the sort of mind-forged manacles that he's referring to? Yes, I think first we can start out with the general statement uh, of a basic attitude of Blake's which is reflected again and again, which is essentially that uh, all restriction is evil. The uh, government, uh, the church, in fact, all man-made institutions are things that uh, block off the natural man, that control man. And these things come out of man himself. These are the manacles that uh, we create to control our behavior and to keep us from leading the life that uh, Blake would approve of. This brings up a modern note. I think the modern sociologist would call this the theory of fictions. Of course, he would leave out the references to man's natural state. Yes, there's the reference to the church as being one of the institutions which has forged these manacles. Uh, 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 leads us on, I think, to the next stanza. Uh, and incidentally, the example that you supplied is the, is the one that, that always occurs to me. The, uh, uh, the church as being an institution which has limited man's possibilities through, through restrictions. And we see that this uh, uh, criticism of the church uh, is mentioned in the, in the third stanza of the poem. How the chimney sweepers cry every blackening church a pause. Perhaps um, we should comment very briefly uh, simply on the syntactical meaning of this sentence. Um, does he mean here, uh, Professor Shepherd, that the church is appalled by the chimney sweeper's cry? Well, I'm not sure that he means that. I think uh, we have to reword it. I think he's saying that the chimney sweepers cry, and of course all that that connotes, uh, strikes quite a contrast with what the church stands for. And in that sense, it may appall the church. I, I don't think he means that the church uh, as a body is particularly appalled by this. I think that he is implying here that there's quite a contrast between the uh, miserable state of the chimney sweeper and what the church stands for. Yes, I think I would agree that clearly enough he is not saying that the church is horrified by the chimney sweeper. As a matter of fact, I think Blake's criticism here is that the church is doing nothing about the chimney sweeper uh, and that the church should be appalled by the chimney sweeper's cry because the very cry of the chimney sweeper uh, reflects a shame upon an institution which allows such conditions to exist uh, in England. One question. Um, can any one of you enlighten me on this plight of the chimney sweeper? I'm not too sure that I know what Blake is getting at here. I think Blake uh, tells us himself in one of his other poems, The Chimney Sweeper, I believe it's called, uh, in which he portrays the youth and innocence of these small boys who were sent to sweep chimneys. Remember, uh, at this time, uh, London was heated by coal fireplaces. They would choke up with the soot, and they send very small boys down to clean them out. The chimney sweeper's cry, by the way, as it comes out in the other poem in London dialect, uh, was weep, 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 uh, which, uh, of course, is sweep, sweep, sweep. They would go through the streets calling sweep, sweep, sweep. But the chimney sweeper here is a symbol of innocence, the symbol that the church should represent. 
And as the sweeper blackens, so also does the church blacken in different ways. We have so, a double play on blacken here. I think that uh, perhaps another thing, the, apparently the occupation was fraught with considerable professional hazard. I don't know whether, again, I don't know whether the children who were lowered into the uh, chimneys had any high rate of mortality, but apparently the profession as a whole was quite subject to cancer. Uh, they had a rather short lifespan. Yes, I think that uh, in this poem, also the uh, the chimney sweeper, of course, throughout the uh, late 18th century fiction, serves as a dramatic example of the uh, uh, horrors of uh, of child labor. Uh, and uh, here, of course, I think we have the image of the chimney sweeper uh, cleaning the the chimney of the church. Uh, Every blackening church, and as Professor Codwell has pointed out, of course, we do have the double play on, on blackening. Not only is the chimney of the church black, but also in a metaphorical way. Uh, the, uh, the cry of the chimney sweeper is a black mark uh, on the institution of the church. A tie in, I think, with the, uh, it should be the original uh, whiteness of both, that the chimney sweep should be leading a natural childhood with rosy cheeks that the, uh, the, the child then lead, lead, leading the life of the simple primitive man. Uh, so also the simple primitive church, before it developed into a thing of mind for its manacles, would be white. I wonder uh, if we don't also have a, uh, a play on the word cry. The word cry suggests uh, suggest pain, I believe. And, uh, of course, Cry in this context not only, I think, suggests pain, but also suggests the, the calling out of the chimney sweeper, as you have suggested his call, sweep, sweep. Uh, our next image is certainly a very dramatic one, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. It's interesting to see how very uh, uh, directly and uh, dramatically, uh, Blake's uh, images and uh, metaphors uh, are formed. Uh, here he thinks of the soldier's sigh uh, and envisions it as a streak of blood down the wall of the palace. Uh, what uh, social condition here does he particularly have reference to, do you think? Why is the why is the soldier sighing? I think we have a restatement here of the same situation we hit in the first two lines. The soldier is like the chimney sweep. Uh, they are both innocent. They are both helpless. The chimney sweep is take, taken as a child and forced to work. The soldier is drafted, uh, sent off to wars. Both cases we have an institution tied in. The uh, church should be doing something about, about child labor, the palace should be doing something about uh, the slaughter of the helpless innocent, uh, neither are. Both represent uh, these mind forged manacles of the previous uh, stanza. Yes, I wonder here if in addition to the what Blake might consider needless slaughter of soldiers on the battlefield, he doesn't also have in mind the plight of the soldier who was injured in battle and forgotten by his country, which is certainly uh, a common picture in 18th century fiction. Uh, the old soldier who lost an arm or lost a leg uh, in the service of his country and who returns to England only to starve because he discovers that he can't make his living and that the country apparently is not sufficiently grateful for his services to provide him with an adequate pension. Whatever we have here, we seem to have uh, some social criticism of some kind. Well, uh, are we ready for the last stanza? But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear. And blights, the play, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Yes, this is certainly very concise language. And when we start, start analyzing 
uh, exactly what Blake has said, uh, I think that uh, we'll discover that this passage illustrates what I was previously mentioning, that unless we watch our step, we become hypnotized by the nursery rhyme effect of the diction and fail to uh, penetrate to the actual image the youthful harlot's curse here is the uh, uh, blasting the newborn infant's tear, I think, is, a, uh, is an interesting um, uh, image. In what sense does the harlot's curse blast the newborn infant's tear? Well, I think here uh, the harlot's curse refers to a venereal disease. Blast means to blight something wasted by a noxious wind, at least that is the dictionary definition. And at this point, uh, the harlot's curse, that is, the venereal disease, blights the newborn infant, withers it. And, of course, I think also we will discover that this has an additional meaning. Uh, the harlot's curse may simply be the indelicate language used by harlots. Uh, what Blake is trying to say, of course, is that conditions which drive young girls into prostitution uh, are, are conditions that uh, predestine uh, the newborn infant to a life of misery, so that the curse here may be simply an imprecation uh, uh, of the newborn, of the of the harlot. Yeah, but note, and blights with plagues the marriage curse. Well, there would be a justification, I suppose, plague and curse. Uh, we might have two separate meanings there, but it uh, seems to me that blighting with plague the marriage curse, certainly referring to uh, premature death of some kind. Of course, here we do have a, a paradox uh, in the last line of this poem, the marriage curse. A hearse is a vehicle which is universally associated with funerals uh, rather than with marriages. Here I think that uh, Blake is suggesting that uh, uh, in a society such as the one that he has pictured in London, marriage, which should be an occasion for rejoicing, becomes a rather tragic affair. I think also the, uh, the mention of marriage has been suggested by the, uh, by the cry of the infant here. Uh, of course, the infant's tear may be the illegitimate infant of the harlot. That's a point that might be brought in the, uh, I suppose you would actually call it murder, the, the large-scale abandoning of children, newborn children. Uh, or just exposed to the elements and left to die because these people had no way to raise them and there were no organized orphanages and things like that, uh, which would give a, another, another level of meaning to this thing. One thing I think we get here is uh, sort of the negative side of a number of natural human institutions. Note down, I mean, the church as it should be, the soldier as he should be, the palace government as it should be, uh, with societies that should be, you would have no harlots, and uh, the newborn infants should be a cause for rejoicing rather than for tears, and they should be laughing instead of crying. Uh, marriage, should, again, should be a uh, be beginning of a happy, natural sort of thing instead of being considered up in terms of a funeral. All of these things go back up again, I think, to the mind towards manacles. It's man's distortion, the restrictions man imposes on himself that cause all these uh, unfortunate, unfavorable results within society. Well, this seems to support my original point, then, that uh, Blake is not a predestinarian. Apparently, at the, in this poem at least, he's not supporting any doctrine of original sin. Uh, sin comes from man, man-made, man-made institution. Uh, and apparently, then, the responsibility rests solely on man, and it's not to be sloughed off by saying, well, uh, this is the way God intended it, uh, everything will be all right in the next world. I wonder if we don't have here the poem closing on a, on a final note of, uh, of, of irony. That is, 
isn't Blake suggesting here that love, which is which seems to be the the cure or the the uh, the solution to to most of the problems that uh, that he poses, that love, uh, which is the very the very source, the very fountain of life, has been so corrupted in this society that young girls are forced into prostitution, that even love is for sale, and that when love becomes a commodity which is for sale on the open market, then marriage becomes like a funeral. The Tiger Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand? And what dread feet? What the hammer? What the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil? What dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Well, gentlemen, in the first stanza of this poem, we have a rather interesting image. A tiger burning. What do you make of that? Well, I think on one level, perhaps the most obvious level, is that the, is that the eyes of the tiger appear to be glowing in the darkness of the forest. I think also the burning bright suggest that perhaps the vivid yellow stripes of the tiger are glowing in the darkness of the forest. Well, we seem to have another problem here, perhaps a minor problem. In the forests of the night, not simply in the forest, but uh, in the forests of the night, why is that partic particular qualification in here? Well, it seemed to me that... Uh, this ties in with the lamb who comes in later on. Note the lamb is associated with sunshine, brightness, broad daylight. Uh, and we have the tiger who is really the opposite principle. The lamb is at one end of the spectrum and the tiger at the other, so the tiger would naturally be associated with darkness, with night. Yes, of course the tiger is, is uh, which is a selection from songs of experience, is often regarded as a companion piece to Blake's other poem, The Lamb, in Songs of Innocence. The question posed here, uh, on the literal level, of course, is simply who framed the tiger? That is, who created the tiger? Now, I think it's interesting that, that Blake indicates pretty clearly his attitude toward the creator of this tiger, uh, not through a series of statements, but through a series of questions in the last two lines of the first stanza. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? I think he indicates that there must be something uh, bold uh, about the creator of this creature, uh, which Blake obviously regards as a, uh, as a terrible creature of some sort. He seems to have his own cosmology here. Uh, he seems to know how this was done. We get into the second stanza. The questions clearly imply statements that the tiger, the fire of his eyes, came from some distant deep, I suppose referring to a sea, or he could even be referring to the depths of space, yet uh, he has in here skies. And then, uh, on what wings dare he aspire? Apparently the creator of this tiger is a 
winged creature, and what the hand dare seize the fire? Again, apparently uh, a supernatural being of considerable power or considerable courage uh, to create the tiger. I wonder also if in the opening lines of the second stanza, in what distant deeps or skies, there might not, might not also be the implication that the tiger's origin could be either diabolical or else heavenly. That is, ordinarily we associate the depths with infernal regions, with evil, and skies with uh, celestial regions or heaven or uh, divinity. So maybe even this early in the poem, we have the suggestion that the tiger may owe its origin to some uh, di uh, diabolical source. A, a uh, pairing off here, so to speak, a description of the tiger as well as a peripheral description of the creator of the tiger. We note here that uh, fire comes up, the word fire comes up three times in the first two stanzas. Uh, the suggested the tiger's eyes burning in the darkness of the night, no, not reflecting light, but burning themselves. If we take deeps to mean the depths of space, I wonder if we don't have suggestion here that uh, a sort of celestial fire, the fire of the stars, the fire of the sun, has the same, uh, was drawn uh, upon in the making of the tiger, because the tiger has this uh, same brilliance, the same burning, the same strength that we associate with the sun. It seems to me that as long as we have the forests of the night and this matter of uh, how could any creature dare to create this tiger, it seems to me that the uh, diabolical element is dominant. I disagree there because uh, we have here a series of obviously rhetorical questions. The thing could uh, be easily restated uh, simply uh, instead of why uh, did you do this, simply you did this. So the creator created this simply have a, a series of statements uh, as to how the creator dared to create this thing. But fearful symmetry. How, how do you construe that word fearful? I think how what he's doing mean? here is, is getting outside uh, or his own cosmology, his own theology. He's getting outside the usual concept of the creator, perhaps, uh, which is a strictly positive sort of thing. Here we have a creator who... Uh, creates savagery as well as gentleness, but I don't think we have to postulate a uh, infernal origin of this. He's simply, I think, here expanding his own definition of God. All these things come from God, whether it's the tiger or the lamb. Well, of course, I think that this, uh, uh, that this question perhaps is uh, a little more light is thrown on this question later on in the poem. Uh, I have in mind uh, particularly uh, stanza five, which uh, uh, we have not yet discussed. I think perhaps we should uh, move on now to see that I think also he, by his, men his repeated mention of fire, Blake has provided a sort of transition into, uh, into his basic metaphor uh, upon which the whole poem rests, I think, in the third stanza this begins, and what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart, and when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet. That is, he speaks of the, of the creator of this tiger, whoever he may be, as if he actually shaped this tiger with pure physical force, as if he used his arms, his physical strength, in order to bend this tiger into the shape that he wanted him uh, to be in. Uh, I think there's uh, the last four lines of, of this third stanza, excuse me, the last line of this third stanza also presents a uh, problem in uh, a logic or syntax or both. And when my heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? Now, I think that, the, uh, that although we do have a sort of rhetorical ellipsis here, the meaning of what dread hand is clear enough. That is, what dread hand dared to uh, 
clasp this creature. The next question, what dread feet, I confess, has always puzzled me. Do either of, you, either of you gentlemen have any light to cast on this question? That is, how would you complete the rhetorical ellipsis? What dread feet did what? Well, what if we took uh, both hands and feet? Of course, we have an opposite difficulty here, but if we took these back not to the creator, but to the tiger itself, uh, when the tigers came to life, well, what dread feet is obvious. Uh, perhaps what dread hands in the sense of what horrible uh, paws with claws. Uh, note the tiger, cat-like animal, uh, in fighting will use its front feet almost as we would use hands, it slashes with them. Would it be a possibility then that this goes back to tiger and not to the creator? Well, there is another possibility. It may mean that the creator of this creature uh, is ready to leave rather quickly, dread feet, ready to run. Uh, this, he's created sort of a Frankenstein's monster. Except that I think um, if we're going to give Blake credit for logical consistency, if we move over into the fourth stanza, we'll see that his next series of questions, or the continuation of this first series of questions, deals with means by which the tiger was shaped. What the hammer what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain, what the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp. Now, I think that we can say that the hand of the Creator, the hammer, the chain, the furnace, and the anvil are all means by which the tiger was created. Um, and this is why I have a little difficulty with feet uh, in the last line of the third stanza. Well, it's possible that uh, Blake needed to complete his rhyme, though I hesitate to attribute motivation here and explain it in that sense, but it, at least it gives us a physical description of the creator. Uh, dread hands, dread feet, in other words, a the creator of this tiger is itself a creature to be feared, uh, possessing the same powers that apparently the tiger has. Is that a possibility? Well, no, what we have here is uh, really sort of a Vulcan image. The uh, god using fire. It was suggesting earlier that, uh, referring to the eyes, the, uh, that the essence of this thing perhaps had been drawn from burning suns, which certainly fits in with this. So frankly, the chain thing has always bothered me a bit. Well, I think that the chain has... Um, what the hammer, what the chain, the chain might refer to some piece of blacksmith equipment. Um, yes, I've always taken this to mean the chain that controlled the bellows in the blacksmith's mm -hmm. shop. Uh, I think most of our imagery here is drawn from the blacksmith's shop, the hammer, the chain, the furnace, the anvil. The uh, diabolical overtones, um, I think, occurred in the next stanza. The stars threw down their spears when they saw this watered heaven with their tears. Uh, it gives us a reaction, apparently, of the angels. And then the rather important question, did he smile to see that he had done this? Was he pleased with it? And did the creator who made the lamb, was he also capable of making the tiger? Well, it seems to me that we can uh, perhaps build that as much as uh, Professor Cogswell may disagree, it seems we can still pursue the diabolical image here because the tiger apparently is the opposite of the lamb. Yes, I think here at least uh, at least um, Blake suggests that the, that the same creator may not be responsible for both creatures, although he, he may be asking this question uh, rather ironically. He may be saying, is it possible that the same creator who could give us the innocence of the lamb could also give us the savagery of the tiger? Asking this only as a rhetorical question, simply implying that the creator is capable of both good and evil. The uh, last stanza of the poem is identical with the first except for the first word. What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? 
uh, has, has moved from what creature could do this to what creature dare do this. And uh, apparently the, this tiger is something fearful and wonderful to behold. Perhaps this time we ought to answer the key question of the whole poem, who or what is the tiger? We've made a few references here and there, but nothing very specific. I think this follows a pattern which comes through much of uh, the poet's work, and that is a pattern of paradox. Uh, here, there's the implied paradox of the lamb and the tiger, two entirely different uh, creatures representing entirely different things, coming from the same source. The And I, th I think here that uh, Blake is simply, through this use of paradox, calling our attention to the fact that this is so, that uh, the tiger is the, you might say, the masculine principle, the principle of violence, the principle of force. The lamb, you made the lamb made thee, the principle of gentleness, the feminine principle. Both of these things exist in uh, God-made man. You would not uh, say then that this is a... Uh, an account of the creation of Satan. No, I wouldn't. Um, I wonder, I think uh, critics are fairly uh, well agreed, in a general way at least, as to the significance of the tiger. If the, if the lamb is innocence, the tiger is often equated with evil. Um, there have been uh, other more specific uh, suggestions made. Uh, for instance, uh, and I think all of these are really defensible, is it possible that here the uh, tiger is symbolic of the, uh, of the wrath of God? The, the God, the type of God that we have pictured, for instance, in the Old Testament, as opposed to the uh, God of uh, meekness, uh, to the God of forgiveness that we have pictured in the New Testament. Uh, is the tiger, in short, the uh, symbol of the punishment of sins, the manifestation of deity which takes the form of, uh, of punishment, uh, uh, eternal punishment perhaps, uh, a principle which Blake had difficulty in reconciling with the uh, uh, forgiveness of sins, which, uh, again, we may identify with the Lamb. Uh, if we accept this interpretation, though, it seems to me that we are now uh, removed from the matter of evil. Uh, anger is an attribute of the deity and uh, also an attribute of man and is not necessarily an evil attribute. Well, then perhaps, the, perhaps all that we can say is that the tiger here seems to be symbolic of the principle of of force or violence of terror in the universe as opposed to the principle of meekness, humility, and innocence that the lamb stands for.